Thanks for starting your week with us. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Lee ji in Seoul. We have plenty on our plate today, so let's get started by taking a look at today's highlights. More foreigners are snatching up Korean products directly from Korean websites, and this is a market projected to be worth billions of dollars. Korea ranks in the bottom tier when it comes to taking in migrants and refugees, despite projections that the country's working age population is expected to start falling in 2017. But first, we begin with a new report that shows that a one percentage point drop in China's gross domestic product could drag down Korea's GDP by up to 0.6 percentage points. The Korea Development Institute says slowing growth in the world's second largest economy would damage Korea's exports and corporate profitability, directly cutting its growth rate by 0.2 percentage points. As China's growth has a direct impact on emerging economies and the global economy as a whole, the think tank projects that Korea may see additional losses of 0.2 to 0.4 percentage points from its current rate of expansion. Korea's top two chip manufacturers, Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix, ranking first and second in the world, continued their lead in the global DRAM market in the third quarter of this year. According to industry tracker DRAM Exchange, Samsung held on to first place with a 46.7% market share, followed by SK Hynix with 28%. U.S. firm Micron Technology followed at third with less than 20 percent. Combined, as Samsung and SK Hynix took up nearly 75 percent of the global market, renewing their record as the largest market shareholders for the fifth consecutive quarter. But DRAM Exchange said the prolonged economic slump and falling demand for PC DRAMs might pose challenges for the Korean chipmakers. In fact, the average contract price of mainstream 4GB DDR3 modules dropped by nearly half in October since the beginning of this year. Korea's largest conglomerate, Samsung Group's governance structure, has been simplified through a series of mergers and asset sales. Market research firm Chebol.com says the number of the group's cross-shareholding loops have fallen from 10 to 7. Cross-shareholding loops are made when firms are linked through equity investment or asset sales. It added that the recent merger of Samsung C&T and JL Industries helped solidify the group's governance structure. Now, watchers say Samsung CNT Corporation helps Samsung Electronics maintain control over the entire conglomerate. And this is significant as Samsung Electronics is the firm in which the controlling E family wields the most power. And for more on last week and this week's stock market action, we have economics reporter Che jin Sa from SBS CNBC joining us on the phone today. Hello, jin Sa. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's start off with last week's market action from Korea. It seems that things remained relatively calm. That's right. Both the Kospi and Kosta closed lower last Friday as both foreign and institutional investors were net sellers of stocks. The cost pay fell by 0.4% to close just above the 2040 level, while the cost stock closed with a slight downtick, shedding 0.22 points. Investors had a wait-and-see mode as they were waiting for the U.S.'s October employment report. There were expectations that the Federal Reserve will raise its benchmark interest rate if the employment numbers indicate a solid upswing. In other words, the report was seen as very likely to nudge the Fed to shift its policy from being accommodative to one of tightening. Meanwhile, as reported earlier last week, Hami Pharmaceuticals announced on Thursday that it signed a $4.2 billion anti-diabetics deal with the French firm Sanofi. This news boosted the entire sector, which closed 10% higher on Friday. However, it failed to lift the index into positive territory. For the entire week, the Korean equity market traded mostly flat with low volatility. Then how did the Korean stock market close on the first day of this week? Hmm. Both indices closed lower in the first session of the week as well. The KOSPI fell by 0.7%, while the KOSDAQ widened its losses to 3.2%. 
Just like last Friday, a sell-off from both foreigners and institutional uh, institutions put downward pressure on the market, although foreigners turned to be net buyers in the late hours of the session. After robust employment data in the U.S., investors were quite cautious about putting more money into the market due to worries of a potential rate hike in December. By sectors most Except for financials closed lower, it is said that financials are beneficiaries of the rising rate environment because they can accumulate more interest rate um, interest margins. The reason the cost stock took a bigger hit was that bio and gaming stocks, which had been rallying, took a beating. Okay, then let's now move on to some major market events lined up for this week. What are some of the issues that will sway the markets, do you think? Yeah, to give you a little context, let me start off with a follow-up on that U.S. job support that I mentioned earlier. It indicated the U.S. economy created 271,000 jobs last month, and the figure was well above market expectations of around 180,000. Hourly wages rose by 2.5% year-on-year as well. It means now we are finally seeing long-awaited wage growth in the U.S. labor market. As a result, expectations for the Fed's December rate hike have soared. 11 out of 13 global investment banks now expect the Fed to raise rates next month. CME FedWatch, a futures market betting against the Fed's rate hike cycle, now suggests there's 70% possibility of the December rate hike. In this same vein, coming this Friday local time is October's U.S. retail sales. This data will have great significance because the Fed's confidence in the U.S. economy largely relies on the country's consumer spending, which accounts for about 70 percent of the whole economy. In other words, if the data is disappointing, it might have an impact on the Fed's economic forecasts and its rate hike schedule. So adding on to employment figures, this will be something a lot of market watchers will have their eyes on. And also for this week, we have the Bank of Korea holding its monetary policy meeting. What can we expect from that? That's right. The BOK's monetary policy committee will take place on November 12, which is a Thursday. The majority of experts don't expect the BOK to make a move at this month's meeting. Rather, it's expected to freeze its benchmark interest rate at 1.5% for five consecutive months. Analysts don't see any reason for the BOK to further lower rates amid moderate recovery in the Korean economy. Instead, expectations for a rate hike sometime next year are rising. Meanwhile, as the Fed is just about to enter its tightening cycle, global investors are turning their eyes to policy support from other central banks, including the European Central Bank, or ECB, and the Bank of Japan, or BOJ. Both are expected to expand their quantitative easing, or QE, program before the year end. This has been Choi jin from SBS CNBC. In a sign of changing times, banks are extending less loans to large corporations as money lent to mom-and-pop shops grew. According to industry sources, the amount of outstanding loans granted by six major banks, including Shinhan and Kungmin, clocked in at nearly 897 billion U.S. dollars as of the end of September. Now, that's a rise of 48.6 billion dollars. The biggest margin of increase was in loans to small and medium-sized businesses, while lendings to large firms firms shrank by almost $2.7 billion in the January through September period. Bank officials attributed this trend to the downturn cycle when lending to large firms can come with greater risks in the face of potential large-scale losses. On the other hand, they said SMEs and self-employed businesses were desirable clients for their higher profitability and lower delinquency rates. Just a couple months ago, in a bid to boost private spending, the Korean government had lifted the range of taxation on certain goods to give consumers the chance to buy more high-end products without the extra burden of taxes. But that window of opportunity is now gone. Our Lee Joo-young explains why. 
rows of luxury bags, all well worth over thousands of dollars, are displayed on the shelves in hopes of attracting customers. After the government raised the ceiling on consumption taxes back in August from 1,700 U.S. dollars to about 4,400, in hopes of spurring consumption. It had hoped this would help lower the price on luxury goods and make them more affordable. But breaking expectations, the price adjustment came only in a handful of fields. While the price tag on gems, jewelry and fur products came down a notch, the cost of five main goods – bags, furniture, watches, cameras and carpets – have simply not budged. This is why, set aside from a select number of items, the government said it will reverse its decision and bring the tax ceiling back down at the end of this month. Officials say if prices remain static, despite the tax break, manufacturers and importers see extra gains, not the final consumers. But many luxury good vendors say they are not at liberty to set their own prices and they must follow policies set by headquarters. This is why critics say Seoul may have been hasty in adjusting the tax ceiling in the first place without conducting ample in-depth analyses of variables that affect price-setting practices. Lee Ju Young, Business Daily. Meanwhile, Hyundai Motor and its affiliate Kia Motors were the top-selling foreign brands in Germany in October, amid an overall drop in demand for imported cars. Data from a German automobile association show that the combined sales of the two Korean brands surpassed 14,000 units last month. Hyundai's sales inched up 0.4 percent on year to over 9,000 units. Kia sales also spiked more than 4 percent to over 5,000 units. Now, this comes despite an on-year drop of over 5 percent in imported car sales in Germany. Scandal-ridden Volkswagen saw its sales drop at home by 0.7 percent from last October, despite a rise in the combined sales of German brands. We've told you about Koreans buying overseas products over the Internet at cheaper prices. But what does the market look like for foreigners who want to buy Korean products directly from Korean companies? Our Eunice Kim takes a look. For many Koreans, a globalized world means nabbing their foreign-made wants directly from overseas companies via the World Wide Web. According to Korea Customs Service, overseas direct purchases made by Koreans expanded tenfold over the past five years, registering sales of $1.1 billion in the first nine months of this year. But what about Korean-made goods? Korean cosmetics, among others, are increasingly sought out by users residing beyond its national borders. And in fact, some $79 million worth of Korean products were snapped up by overseas buyers via Korean websites in the first eight months of this year, a near threefold growth compared to last year. So which country makes up the biggest chunk of the sales? I'd often want to replenish products I'd bought in Korea, and this website carries lots of good products. That's right, China. Customers in China made up 42 percent of Korea's global direct purchase market, followed by Singapore and the U.S., together constituting 80 percent of products directly bought from Korean companies. Many Chinese tourists who visit our store and enjoy our products download our application to make more purchases after returning to China. And it's a market that vendors say is still in its infancy. We'll see the real growth next year. Once the Korea-China FDA comes into effect, we expect the market to be several times bigger than what it is now. It's a market that one research center projects will be worth 4 trillion won in a few years. That's $3.5 billion. An opportunity that experts say should be managed with care. In merchandising and delivery, for example, so to build customer trust now for a business relationship blessed in its longevity. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. Korea continues to be relatively inactive when it comes to taking in migrants and refugees. According to a recent OECD report, Korea's ratio of migrants to population was 0.13% in 2013, far below the OECD average of 0.62%. This places Korea 20th among the 22 member countries surveyed.
Switzerland topped the list with just under 1.6 percent, followed by Norway and Australia. People that were granted refugee status here in Korea came to about 4.3 percent of the total applicants, also ranking near bottom on the OECD list. With Korea's working age population expected to start falling from 2017, some experts are urging the government to open its doors to more migrant workers and refugees. And that does it for today, but we'll be back tomorrow at the same time, same place, so don't forget to tune in then. Thanks for watching, and bye-bye for now.